Ahora. Ahora está, ahora lo tenemos, sí. Ok. okay. Sí. Welcome to the Education Office of the Embassy of Spain. With over 18 offices in the US and Canada, we are committed to the promotion of the Spanish language and culture by means of varied educational outreach initiatives. Are you looking for professional development opportunities? The Education Office and prestigious universities in Spain sponsor language, culture, and methodology summer courses for teachers and administrators. While you study, live the Spanish language and culture. It'll be the experience of a lifetime. The Education Office of Spain also has 11 resource centers located in different colleges and universities that offer workshops, courses, and resources for teachers, students, and administrators. How about enhancing your school team with a native Spanish speaker and cultural expert? The Visiting Teachers from Spain program enables school districts to recruit highly qualified teachers for elementary, middle, and high school levels. The program is an international cooperation initiative endorsed by the Ministry of Education of Spain and sponsored by educational agencies in the U.S. and Canada. Our ESA program offers dual language immersion schools, educational resources, professional development, and all the benefits of belonging to a network of high-performing schools. Our annual School of the Year and Teacher of the Year competitions celebrate outstanding educational experiences. Ever thought about living in Spain for a year? Building cultural ties, learning Spanish and traveling? Language assistants in our NALCAP program work under the supervision of language teachers in K-12 schools in Spain. The Education Office of the Embassy of Spain, while promoting diverse educational outreach programs, delivers a significant impact on the advancement of the Spanish language and culture in the U.S. and Canada. Hi. Good evening, everyone. Buenas tardes. Buenas tardes a todos. Eh, hoy tenemos el placer de recibir aquí, en, de tener en nuestro seminario al doctor David Preston. Here we have the pleasure today having with us David Preston. Uh, when you go through David Preston curriculum, uh, you are surprised by two things. One is for his, uh, his long experience how long he has been teaching. He's been teaching for nearly 30 years. He's been, um, also he's been uh, in practice in Los Angeles and UCLA for 11 years. And he's been teaching high school courses since 20, 2004. Um, so he's a person who knows very well what to do not, not only in the class, but also in the whole uh, teaching system. <clears throat> the other thing that comes up is that uh, he's one of the best open source learning experts. He has been dealing with open source learning for a very long time and collaborating with some very relevant organizations. Uh, for example, the TED, uh, the TED UCLA or the Royal Geographical Society in London. Nowadays, he's still teaching. He teaches in California, Central Coast. And he is uh, he's also paying not only to, uh, to, for teachers, but also for students. Now, today, he's here to talk about pandemic pedago pedagogy, how to engage learners, deliver content, and stay sane in a difficult time. David, go ahead. Thank, Thank you so you. much, Nieves. <clears throat> Welcome, everyone. And I'm so impressed that at the end of the day, no matter which time zone we're in, on a Thursday, toward the end of the week, 
that you still have the energy to click on to one more Zoom meeting and make yourselves available for information. You know, to start, about 23 years ago, I wrote a book on time. Uh, this was my doctoral research uh, when I was working on the PhD. And it was personally relevant to me because in any language, in any part of the world, we have such an emphasis on being busy. And as I speak to you today, I'm aware of the fact that we have many people who speak Spanish and their English isn't as good. My Spanish isn't as good as my English. I told my co-panelists, I muchas palabras en español que no me recuerdo porque no practico bastante, and it's true. My second favorite phrase in Spanish is despacio. And my reasoning is that when a person knows that they're fluent, as many of you know, you tend to think and dream in the language that you're becoming fluent in. When I speak or hear Spanish, I have to translate in my mind, I have to take an extra step and translate from English to Spanish and back and forth, as do almost all of my students who are native Spanish speakers. So today, I want to encourage you to interrupt. If I don't see a comment or a question in the chat, I'm hoping that my co-panelists can draw my attention to it and I can answer as many in real time as possible. If I miss something from you, then please feel free to follow up with me via email and I'll put up my contact information in a moment. But the reason I'm saying these things at the beginning is that when people talk about open source, they typically think one of two things. They either think about software or they think about uh, materials for the curriculum. Now I include both of those in my philosophy, but I also include the process because as soon as someone joins our conversation, if we're aware of their standing with us, we change our behavior. If you're driving in your car and you look up in your rearview mirror and you see a police officer, it changes you physiologically. Your heart rate gets faster, your palms might get sweaty, you're checking more consciously how fast you're going, whether your seatbelt is on, how loud your radio is playing, and the same is true when we are observed in our learning and in our teaching. So today, because all of us are under such time pressure, because all of us are so conscious of what we're doing, I'd like to raise the stakes because in two to three hours, we will have no more chances at December 3rd, 2020. We get one opportunity to make this wonderful and the opportunity cost is extreme. We're giving up every other possibility to spend this time together right now. So if at any point you find that this could be more valuable for you, give me a chance to make it so. And if for whatever reason your time is better spent elsewhere, please go. Not because I don't want to be with you, but because I want you to get the most value out of these hours. We will be recording this session and I will be annotating the recording with show notes. In other words, at a minute and a second interval, I will include links to the resources that we discuss in this conversation. So let's talk about imperfection. You know, we're all using technology and to some degree that can be fun. For example, I can remove the distractions from the things I want you to see. So if you're taking any kind of notes and you wanna jot this down, please feel free to email me anytime at david at davidpreston.net. You can also find me on Twitter and you can also look at my website if that's something of interest to you. And for us as teachers, when we're trying to think about how we manage people's concentration, I like to put myself a little bit further out and focus on the ideas that I discuss with you. So to start with, I'd like to introduce a concept called Kintsugi, and I'll put the word in the chat. Kintsugi, if you haven't heard of this, is the Japanese art of repair. And the reason this is important is because for us, you know, when you think about breaking things, especially in a disposable culture like the United States, where we like to buy our way to happiness 
and think that the next product or the next tool is going to be the answer to our problems. When something breaks, we tend to throw it away. In Japanese culture, when a vase breaks, or in this case, a bowl, there is an art to repairing it and to filling in the cracks with gold or silver powder and lacquer, and it becomes something new. It becomes something beautiful in its own right, and it tells a story. So all of the imperfections that we may be experiencing right now during the pandemic-related school closures or during the heightened awareness around social unrest related to racism, all of this becomes part of our story. And, you know, this can be very pressurized. This world of education of ours, uh, I just traded emails with a colleague and it's important for you and me to both be aware. I'm a practicing classroom teacher. So I have 174 students in the central uh, coast area of California. I work with colleagues who stress about the same things that I imagine are challenging some of you. And just a few days ago, as you can see behind me, the department chairs in my school district asked faculty what they thought of giving students the opportunity to improve their fall semester grades if they did more and did better during the spring semester. Well, one of my colleagues, as you can see in the middle email wrote, no way. What about rigor? What about accountability? And I think, at this point in history, we have an opportunity to re-examine some of the assumptions that underlie our approach to education. For starters, what is your view of human nature? Do we believe that given the opportunity, people will do the right thing? Or do we believe that given the opportunity, people will seek every advantage to be lazy or unaccountable or do the wrong thing? Now, I'm not here to advocate for how you should look at everyone in your life, but it seems to me as educators, we are in the business of helping grow people, grow their capacity for integrity, not just honesty, but integrity as in integrating their thoughts, their words, and their actions. That we should be in the business of helping people become independent and self-sustaining as hard as it might be for me sometimes, because I do get frustrated with the adults in my practice. The students, the students I have an almost endless regard of patience because they're doing their jobs. They're pushing the envelopes and the boundaries. That's what you know, adolescents were, are meant to do. They're operating in their environment and seeing what works and what doesn't. But the adults sometimes, especially in a culture where we're dealing with so much that seems to be made of our own behaviors, sometimes, and yet, I don't believe that anyone wakes up in the morning intending to self-sabotage or intending to make the rest of us miserable. So when it comes to flexibility, I started talking about time. Einstein created this theory called special relativity. And what I was fascinated to learn is that around that period of time, Scientists were trying to figure out how to explain the phenomenon of movement when everything else was moving. Isaac Newton gave us the three laws and, and we certainly had a way of thinking about it when something was fixed, but when everything was moving relative to everything else, that's when things got complicated. Now in schools, if we assume that time is fixed and we have to have something done by the bell, or we have to have something done by the due date, we're missing out on a large part of our thought process. The French have a concept called l'esprit de l'escalier, the thought at the bottom of the stairs. And the phrase was coined by a man who felt so overwhelmed in conversation with someone who was advocating a position that he couldn't think straight until he got out of the room and literally got to the bottom of the stairs. Now, I'm wondering if I'm the only one here. Has anyone ever had the experience of being in conversation? It gets intense and we just, bah, but we think of the right thing to say. 
20 minutes after the conversation has ended. Well, that's how learning works. We don't stop operating just because a bell rings and class is over or because an assignment is due and a grade has been given. So right now, because of all of the synchronous and asynchronous tools people are being asked to use during the pandemic, we have a unique opportunity to explore some of these ideas and we'll do that today. You know, to start with, I talked about the idea that we make assumptions about how our brains work. And if I told you that a subneuronal lightning storm accounted for all of your experiences of being alive, it would be a big leap. But the fact of the matter is that the neurons in our brains are not connected physically. They have gaps in between them. If you look at this diagram, you can see, you see if I'm pointing the right direction, the dendrites go toward the axon, and then there's a gap. The gap is called the synapse. And in that gap, there's an electrical charge. Now, what we've learned about plasticity of the brain is that when we have ideas, the neurons that fire together eventually wire together. That's what accounts for habitual behavior. When you do something like crack your knuckles and you do it over and over again, you wind up doing it without thinking or at least having the conscious experience of thinking. Well, that's how we learn to go through school. And unfortunately, that leaves us actually less able to think when we graduate. Most people, when they graduate, have to actively recover from their education. Nieves mentioned that I came back to teach high school in 2004. Part of the reason why was that at that point, we had just gone through another crisis in this country. We had gone through 9-11 a couple of years earlier. And I had been teaching at UCLA for 11 years. And I was consulting for companies, most of whom were startups, but some were in professional practice and some were international Fortune 100 corporations. At every single step of the way, my students at UCLA, my students in the Graduate School of Education, and my professional practice clients all privately said the same thing. I didn't learn what I needed for my job in school. And when you think about it, in school, we are taught eyes on your own paper, don't speak unless you have permission, don't go to the bathroom unless you have permission. You know, I don't hear anybody who's learning virtually nostalgic for the bathroom pass right now. But you learn all of these things in school, and then when we go into the workplace, a manager or an entrepreneur looks at us and says, why can't you be a better communicator? Why can't you be a better team player? Now, this architecture of the brain looks a lot like the architecture. This looks like a beautiful picture of a galaxy or a nebula. In fact, it's a map of the internet. And this is the digitized version in the inset. And when I teach, when we talk about networking, we're talking about it at every level. We're trying to integrate our thought processes with how we articulate our experiences with the things we do in the world. And simultaneously, we're trying to create a sense of self in a mediated world. Now this didn't start with the pandemic. The internet is 50 years old. And I am not aware, and maybe some of you can enlighten me, of any curriculum or awareness building campaign in which we teach what the internet is or how it works or the impact that it has on our government, on our economy, and even on our personal lives and daily habits. Americans look at their cell phones something like 83 billion times a day. The individual person looks at their cell phone dozens, if not hundreds of times a day. But when we don't manage our devices, our devices wind up managing us. And I see some comments in the chat. Are cameras working? Are people able to see me clearly? Yes. Okay, great. Only, yes, yes. I just they only, they, they, No, they were, they were wondering if they could see each other, which they can't. Ah, okay, sorry. Okay. 
Um, okay. And you know, that's something that I'm going to get to in a few moments because our choices about the tools that we use and how we use them, including managing who can see whom and who can hear whom, is really important to our conversation. All of these are critical decisions. All of these involve critical thinking. So before the pandemic, um, when campuses were open and people were on campus, and I'm talking about decades of, of schooling and experience that we all have with this, I'm gonna come back to you now and take the slide down. I'm curious, has anyone here ever gotten any direct instruction from a teacher in a school about how to focus their attention? Yes, we all get told to pay attention. I was told to pay attention by a hundred teachers a thousand times if I was told once. But no one ever took me aside and said to me, David, here's how you can actively concentrate more effectively. Otherwise, if I had that training, I wouldn't have gone to so many parties, met so many wonderful people, and two seconds later found myself wondering, oh, what was her name? I had to learn that information somewhere. Our students don't know how to do these things naturally. They don't come by it on their own. More importantly, when the bell rings from one class, students don't get any information about how to conclude their thinking about one set of topics, go out into the sea of people in the hallway, get to their next class, unload their backpack, and then switch gears into the next topic. So to start, I'd like to share with you how we dealt with mindfulness in my courses. And I'd like to take you through a quick exercise so that we can do a little bit of this together. So I'm gonna switch from one camera to another here. And I'm going to show you on a shared screen, first of all, a little bit about how we look at tools. So, I show students a video when we start school, and this is a commercial that I think aired in Israel of all places. So let's have a look together. Emma. Huh? Emma. 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 So, when you think about the applicability for us, obviously, the advent of the internet is an extraordinary powerful moment in human history. We have more communications capability and more ability to share more types of information than we ever had at any point in human history. But more people feel more alone than ever before. More people feel disconnected. Even right now, although I can see that we have a 123 participants already on this meeting, I don't have any real sense of who you are. I can't see your faces. I don't even know if you have feet. What can we do in this mediated environment to bridge those gaps and bring people closer together? Well, let's start by thinking about how life operates in a normal classroom. In a normal classroom, students come in, uh, we hope by the bell so that we can start class together as a group, but that's not always the case. In fact, in my experience, especially in California comprehensive high schools, being late is a real problem. And the way that we deal with it as a culture on campus doesn't help. Um, I know that tarde is the, the cognate in Spanish, and so tardy probably makes sense as a word to use. But culturally, you know, words that make sense or sound good don't always translate very well. Um, you know, the classic example for me in corporate branding for Spanish is the Chevy Nova. You know, some of you may know the story, but when Chevy tried to market that car in Mexico, you can imagine the response. 
Nobody wanted to buy a car that didn't literally didn't go. Well, in America, when people use words like tardy, um, it makes sense in school because it's, there's an expectation. But if you're at work in the private sector and someone comes in late to a meeting and they say, oh, well, gee, why are you tardy? Uh, the other person may as well say, well, because I'm an adult and it took me a little bit of extra time to get here, why are you talking to me like a third grade teacher? So I like to start relationships with students with respect. And I engage them fully in making decisions about how the culture will operate. I know that teachers say these kinds of things all the time, but the practices that I'm about to model for you, I think will show you a different level and a different way of engaging students that doesn't necessarily limit itself to classrooms in physical campuses. We can model these things and I do online and I'll show you a couple of ideas how. So when we start courses in my class, we tend to start and I'll, let's see if I can find a current blog just to show you what's going on today in my courses. So here's today's agenda. Uh, this was this morning. Your mom, the minute of mindfulness, I'll come to that in a moment. But then we write in our journals. Now writing in a journal obviously takes some concentration. And if you're not able to concentrate, it can be very frustrating. So I asked my students what would help. And I don't, don't like babysitting. I did that when I was 12 once. I hated the job. So I tend not to stand over students' shoulders. And I teach high school, so developmentally, most of my students have an expectation they should be able to take care of their, at least their bodies and their own decisions. But once in a while, they need help. So at one point, a student looked up from across the room and said, would you please tell Juan to shut the F up? Not very kind language, but if we're being honest, it happens all the time. And at that point, we had to have a conversation. So just around that time, I had taken my family to see a production of Les Miserables at the Pantages Theater in Los Angeles. And because of the way I curate online, I share these experiences with students in real time, that's me when I was five, um, so that they can see exactly what I'm talking about. This is me and my family. This is important. Our students have the idea that we exist in the classroom, but if you've ever run into a student in the town outside of campus, it can be a very jarring experience. They don't expect that we actually have lives. Now, I should point out, in the interest of full transparency and full disclosure, this is actually my bookcase from my living room when my house is normal. But right now, it's a background because right now my house is in complete disarray and my books are all over the place and things are a mess and I'm facilitating a pandemic pedagogy online seminar instead of rearranging my books. So this will have to do. But when I share those kinds of things with my students, it makes me a bit more human and it allows people to see that I'm not perfect. And I just looked in on the chats and thank you for uh, pointing out the uh, false cognates. And you know, when I make a mistake in front of students, it's a blessing. It's like those cracks in the Japanese vase because that becomes part of our conversation. So when the journal wasn't working because students were arriving late, we started talking about mindfulness in a different way. And we talked about how people in a classroom or people on a Zoom call for that matter, have an expectation of what's going to happen with their time. And so we started a practice and you saw the sign on the last image. This sign was up on the door of my classroom and it was against school policy. You can't lock students out of a classroom, but I didn't lock the door and I didn't make the policy. This was students agreeing that the first five minutes of class, we needed to be able to concentrate. And for students who showed up late, nobody was gonna be mad at them. If a student shows up late to my class on Zoom, glad you're here. And the whole thing's being recorded if you need to follow up asynchronously. But 
you can't interrupt the people who are trying to learn because we got here on time and we're ready to go. Now, the next question became fine. I've now taken care of some of the outside noise, but what about the inside noise? And this is where I'd like to do a quick exercise with you. Because when people see the word meditation, they tend to think of it as some mystic experience, you know, a monk on a mountain somewhere. We have a lot of, how should we say, multiple understandings and interpretations of cultural practices that tend to interfere with basic habits that can help us. When I say meditation, I literally mean to sit. And what I'd like to do is show you exactly what I taught my students. When I'm sitting in a chair like this, I just put my feet flat on the floor and I'm going to invite you to do the same. See if you can feel the floor with your feet. Even if you're wearing shoes and socks, see if you can just contact the surface and recognize that you're somewhere. Same thing with your butt in the seat. And yes, I'm being indelicate. You can also do this with your hands on your knees. And just as you feel your knees with your hands, see if you can feel your hands with your knees. The key here is to have a physical presence in the room. And by present, I really mean two things. I mean the physical awareness of sitting in the chair, but I also mean right now, the present. Most of our depression comes from feelings about the past. And this is research borne out most of our anxiety comes from feelings about the future, anticipation. So if we can just focus on this moment right now and not the past and not the future and simply breathe, and you're right, I just see the, the comment in the chat about it's not easy to meditate and be present when you have a long list of tasks. And there's a wonderful story about a man who's very busy and says, I do not have the time to meditate. I cannot meditate for five minutes. And the teacher says, you're right. You shouldn't meditate for five minutes. If you're feeling that busy, you should meditate for an hour. There's an opportunity cost to this for sure. But bear with me for one minute. Literally, I'm gonna set my timer for 60 seconds. Now, during that 60 seconds, I have no expectations of what will happen in your mind undoubtedly thoughts will arise, feelings will arise. Great, I don't have any judgment about that. If it's a feeling or a thought that is worth spending a moment with, embrace it, sit with it. But remember something more. Remember that there's a you that's deeper than those thoughts and feelings. There's an observer who's watching those thoughts and feelings come up. And that observer has a lot of power. This is the power of your mind. You have the choice when a thought comes up, whether to engage it or whether to imagine that it's coming up on your phone and simply swipe or imagine it like a flower on the breeze and watch it blow away or a leaf on a stream float down river. 60 seconds is all. Now what I'd like you to do is experiment. I'm going to close my eyes because I know that when I take away one of my senses, the other senses get heightened. So for 60 seconds, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put my hands on my knees. I'm going to put my feet on the floor and I'm just going to breathe. And if I have a thought that comes up, I'm going to let it go because this is my gift to myself. I get a minute of being completely thoughtless. Now at the end of 60 seconds, I'm going to ask you a couple things about how you feel, but I don't have any expectations. So if you'd be so kind, Join me for 60 seconds of just breathing. I'm just going to take a deep breath in and blow it out. And I'm going to do that again for 60 seconds.
that was it. Now here's my request. As you think about how you felt before the 60 seconds started and how you feel about now, if you can boil it down to one word in English or in Spanish, would you be so kind to take a moment and put it in the chat? And I'll give us a minute to do that. Ah, Alicia, I see refreshed, that's nice. Okay, tranquila, relajada. Beautiful. Sleepy. <laughs> Complete. Ah, near the end. Stop. <laughs> Wonderful. Now, can you imagine? Free. Ah. Okay, so one person said busy. I love that. And, and the reason I'm pointing that one out is because I don't have any expectations and it's interesting what comes up. Um, so to me, this is like the deal of the century. When you think about those responses, if you were to tell students, hey, listen, in one minute, I can virtually guarantee that you're gonna feel something and that it's almost guaranteed to be better than what you felt before and it's free, and it's easy and you can do it anytime. In fact, get this, if you really wanna be a secret agent about it, you can do it with your eyes open while people are sitting right next to you because it's your mind. Now, this is just a beginning practice and this is how I open every single class, whether it's on Zoom or whether it's in person. It's important to help students understand that they're in control. Now, part of that is like this Zoom call, I often can't see my students. Earlier I mentioned that I begin my relationship with students from a place of respect. So for starters, I ask them to help me understand their names because on the learning management systems that teachers get in public school districts or even sometimes independent schools, um, the names as they are listed are not how the students want to be identified and known in the world. So job one is to find out who they are and how their name. Wonderful, Maria, I see that you do the same thing in your classes. The second thing I do is I help them understand why I offer them the choice to turn their camera on or to leave it off. Now, I can only imagine what some of your experiences have been. And in fact, if you have any uh, experiences worth relating, I'm, I'm curious. I have heard some absolutely bizarre sounds when students have turned on their microphones during Zoom. Some of it is so endearing. I've, I've met some really wonderful younger siblings that are in my students' care. In fact, we started a family story time because they were around the computer and we wanted to engage and it made life easier and more fun for everyone. But I've heard everything from dogs tearing apart sofas, uh, a, a distressed pig trying to get out of someone's bedroom. Um, it's um, traffic noise, screaming. The amount of distraction is intense. And the amount of awareness that our students want or don't want when it comes to a teacher or an institution looking in on their lives. I've had students, as I'm sure you have, who way before the pandemic would come to class late and tell me, you know, hey, Esme, why did you come to class so late? Well, the police were out. Oh, at your house? Is everything okay? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. At my house, it's fine. But they were down the street and my mom doesn't have papers, so we couldn't go outside until they were gone. Or another student's father being pulled over for a traffic infraction, not stopping for a stop sign, but then it turned out they weren't police, they were ICE, and we haven't seen dad in two months. So with all of that background, one way that I can show respect and make things easier for my students, and I don't mean easier academically, I mean easier in relation to the experience of learning, is not forcing them to do something against their will that creates more tension. Um, I think we need to be very careful when it comes to features on Zoom like seating charts or uh, things like turnitin.com, you know, all the plagiarism surveillance software that we have out there now. Escalating the mistrust is 
not a recipe for a happy ending. And I see the comment about ADHD and Asperger being on the spectrum. Yes, absolutely. We have so many students with diagnosed and undiagnosed issues and a baseline of stress. You've probably read the same meta studies that I have. We have students with a baseline of stress, depression, anxiety, that in the 1950s would get someone institutionalized. So when we have the opportunity to make things more collaborative and to learn from and with our students, I take every single one. Now technology gives us some opportunities that we didn't have before. So for example, uh, again, I'll go back to my current class and where is my current class? So this is a world literature class that I'm teaching right now. And I do a few things that I'd like to share with you. So for starters, you can see this tab on their course blog. And this is a public course blog. This is, in fact, here's what I'll do. So this link that I just shared with you, you can see on the public internet. And I'll put it right here in the chat in case you'd like to put it on your own machine. Uh, if I can find it. There's our chat. From day one, students have been able to schedule a meeting with me. They can click on this and go right to a Calendly calendar. It was free to me to set up. And the back end function of this, I shared with teachers because my school district was using Canvas and I have problems with Canvas. When our students create content, you know how it was in the old days, a student would write you an essay, it would have an audience of one, you would write some comments and a grade on it, return it to the student, the student would then crumple it up in their backpack, and it would be lost to history. Well, now, students have the opportunity to share on the public internet and create value in real time. But companies like Canvas and the College Board, even though it's a nonprofit, it operates in some ways as though it were for profit. Microsoft 360, you know, OneDrive, OneNote. These companies take student data and they trade on it for profit without the student's permission or even without public knowledge. And I don't want to participate. I have an ethical issue in participating in creating intellectual sharecroppers. I want very much for our students, if they're creating data that has so much value that the ed tech sector has become an $8 billion a year industry, I want the students to own the value of what they create. And I don't think you need to be a critical theorist or a radical to embrace the idea that knowledge is power. You know, from Francis Bacon to Paulo Freire to Peter McLaren to today, we have this tradition that seems like they're on the edge and it's political. To me, nothing is more basic. If you write something, you own what you write. Now, if you agree to share it through a publisher, well, you're an adult, you can make that agreement. But if you're in school and you're not given a choice, well, already we're setting you up to be a consumer or a user. There are only two industries that use the phrase user to describe the people who are on the other end of the transaction from those who create the service or the product. Users are only users when you're talking about software and when you're talking about drugs. And unfortunately, what we've come to discover is that software, especially social media, is designed for the same level of addiction as narcotics. So to come back to this process, here's what happens when a student creates a meeting with me. So they go on that tab, they say, I'm gonna schedule a meeting and they go to my calendar. This calendar, which again is free to use, is integrated with my Zoom account. So it creates a Zoom meeting automatically and then it populates my Google Calendar. Now, tonight I'm gonna to go through some of these things fairly quickly, but again, in the recording of this session, I will annotate the notes and I'll create links for you. And I'll tell you the same thing I tell my students. I am a very imperfect person. I'm sure that some of what I say, some of you will say, oh, that sounds like a great idea. Other things will be confusing and still other things you might say, oh my gosh, who does this guy think he is? I would never do that. All of that's fine and welcome. But 
like in any family, and that's what I consider this extension, my students know that they can reach out to me with anything at any time, and I will extend the same opportunity to you. Um, in fact, well, I'll save this, but somewhere in here, just today, students reached out to me in the weirdest way, but so much fun. Uh, but it, long story short, if you want help doing this later on, help is available. And what this creates is students who ordinarily don't consult with their professors or their teachers on a one-on-one -on -one basis now have an open invitation to do that at any time. When I was teaching at UCLA, it wasn't uncommon for me to have classes that were 200, 300 uh, general education classes at UCLA for undergraduates could be as large as almost a thousand people. So I didn't normally get to know my students on an individual basis. And even though we had office hours, a lot of the time students did not take advantage of that. Uh, I would sit by myself in, in Moore Hall at UCLA's campus. It was a great time to get stuff done. But at this point, we have so many students who by their nature, by their age, sometimes by their culture, are reluctant to approach an authority figure and get their needs met, it becomes really important for us to extend that open door. Um, as long as I'm talking about needs, you know, before we joined uh, with all of the attendees, the panelists were talking a little bit about um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And there is a tradition of communication that is very much based on shared connections and shared needs. So if you are at all familiar with nonviolent communication, for example, or restorative dialogues or restorative circles, there are some truly wonderful ways, both in person and online, that we can engage with our students to meet their needs. So part of the subtitle of this talk, uh, and I see the chat uh, question about submitting assignments. I, I'll get to that next. Part of the subtitle of this talk was how to engage students. And there was a study done. It was an informal study. It was an actual, it was a journalist, I believe, who did this. But there was a journalist who shadowed high school students throughout their day. And at the end of it, she reported being absolutely exhausted. Not just from the physical effort, in fact, it was from the non-effort physically of sitting and then walking to another fluorescent lit box and sitting. Being that passive was such a drain on her energy. But the reason I'm bringing it up at this point is that she also reported feeling like a nuisance. She felt really uncomfortable asking her professors or teachers questions. She felt like to ask a question was to interrupt. Now, I love that. I love questions and I love interruptions and I'll set the stage right now by answering one. The books on my background used to be arranged by title and subject. My wife, who has a wonderful aesthetic, rearranged them by color. And at first, it was maddening because I couldn't find anything. But then I realized two things. Number one, it was beautiful. And number two, every single time I looked for a book, I had to take a tour which inevitably led to things I hadn't predicted and changed my thought process. How wonderfully open source. So yes, they are arranged by color. Um, I'm looking at a couple of questions in the chat that I do want to address. So in order, someone asked, how do students submit their work? So submit is a very loaded word, right? To submit is to surrender. That implies a power structure. So students do share their work but they curate their work in my courses. And for that matter, I don't call them students, I call them members of a network. And that may seem like a small thing. It may seem like, oh, you know, Preston, you're adorable with your use of language, but really, it's still a student. Well, yes, no one's confused about their relationship with a teacher in a school environment. But this is a network. And in the network, you don't have that power differential. Everyone owns their own words. I mentioned intellectual property a few moments ago, but owning our words also implies taking responsibility for what we put out into the world. That's also a form of entrepreneurship. So students each maintain their own blogs. And you can instantly see differences, and I'll just cycle through these quickly, you'll have the links. 
But you can see in just a few blogs, you've got difference in style, difference in graphics, difference in everything. And what makes this personalizable and differentiatable is that now we can look at their metadata. I can compare, let's see, Alfredo just posted yesterday. That's pretty great. And he looks like he's pretty consistent. Up oh, there was a gap between December and November 17th here. And I might be able to say to him, again, without making assumptions, yeah, Alfredo, what happened? Did you get busy? Did you get trapped under something heavy? Did the internet cut out? All of these are offerings and invitations to conversations. Because as I learn from the students, I'm also getting a better idea of where they are strong, where they need help, where they are thinking they're strong, but actually have the wrong idea, which might require some reteaching. And when we boil things down to that second dimension, you know, if we think about a multiple choice test, and if you imagine A, B, and C are the apices of a triangle, most tests tell you what the student answers, but they don't tell you why. And here, as I look at what these students produce, and I see how they're thinking about what they're thinking, now I can ask questions that will lead me to a deeper understanding. And along the way, I can also see the metadata. I can see when they post. And you know what? Maybe Sulima down there posts better in the morning than she does in the evening. Or maybe she's posting at 3 o'clock AM, and that's worth asking a question about sleep or work schedule or a level of care as an inquiry. So first, that's the question about how do students share their work. Um, also, you saw there were some students who had taken their, uh, let's see, look, this is a student who transferred out, but I forgot to take away the blog. That last post was August 19th. Um, there was a student up here who had posted journal assignments, and here we go. Let's take a look at this one. No, oh, that's not the one I thought it was. There was a student, as I was scrolling through a moment ago, I noticed that someone had, here we go, had scanned his work. So one of the things I taught students to do was take their handwritten work and use freeware online so that instead of just taking a picture of it, they could create a scan of the page. Now, why is this important? Well, again, when we type, we're using one part of our brain but handwriting exercises different parts of our brain. And when students are writing in their journals, they're also free to write whatever they want. So if they need to rage on something, you know, of course, as a teacher, I'm a mandated reporter and I remind them of this, but apart from that, their journal is their journal. And their journal is very important. Not only is it important for the reasons that we know to be important with writing, but let's see if I can find this easily. Um, there was a lot of attention given in the spring to the fact that most of what we know about indigenous cultures from Mesoamerica came to us during a pandemic, during the great dying, when people cloistered in a convent and kept journals. So you may have noticed that, and again, I'm going through these quickly, don't worry, I'll publish the links when we publish the recording. But if you look at the daily journal, every single day, it has an option to choose your own topic. The journal topics that I provide are designed to integrate real experience with conversations we've had on Zoom, with the things that we're reading, with the practices that we're engaging in to develop conceptual understanding and skill mastery all good and fine, but there's a very real lived experience happening right now and a story will be told. Last semester, I invited students to help me write a book and I forgot what we named it, but I liked it a lot. I'll put that in the link too. Um, because sometime soon, whether we get a vaccine, whether we get herd immunity, whether we go through the great dying because we can't figure out how to wear a mask or not or without making it political, someone is going to come to us, all of us, and ask us, 
hey, you were doing this in 2020, right? You were doing this during the great coronavirus pandemic. What was it like? And apart from giving my students the opportunity to exercise some agency and make choices about how they document their lives, because I can help them improve as writers no matter what they write, there's a real value. I don't know what your experience is with uh, memory, but eyewitness testimony is notoriously suspect. It's notoriously unreliable. Even when, if any of you have experience in um, uh, weight loss and adjusting nutrition, I don't say diet because whatever we eat is our diet. If I eat three boxes of Twinkies, I'm on the Twinkie diet. But when people first start to set goals around weight loss or around improving their nutrition, one of the most popular tactics is to start writing down what we eat because we don't remember. We don't park that in the conscious levels of our brain that stay focused. Um, so when my students write about their daily experience, it provides all sorts of benefits. Now, I know that in the chat, there was a question about, I'm gonna go over here and refresh my memory a bit. Um, yeah, I see the, the ideas about uh, distractions and the percentage of kids. So the percentage of kids that would show an interest in making appointments with me, I actually made the request. I said to everyone, hey, look, I'm lonely. I don't get the experience of being with all of you and sharing all that energy. Now, I have a pretty good energy plant. If you can't tell, I can manufacture energy because I get excited about this, but I have no idea what's out there. I don't know if somebody's like, you know, <laughs> trying to braid their cat or what out there. I have no idea, but I miss that. And so I asked students to please check in with me at least once. Once they did, they became repeat customers because normally in one of those meetings, I would ask a question and then I'd shut up. This is talking a lot for me. And I understand the nature of this medium so it's okay, but, ah, thank you, Senora Trujillo, I, I'm appreciative of that. Um, but when we think about the student experience, they just need that crack in the door a lot of the time. Now I say they, that sounds like an overgeneralization and it is because different students, different individuals have different orientations to how adult figures are. As we got deeper into the semester, I asked for a second round of check-ins because a lot of my students, I would follow up with emails like a lot of you. Occasionally I would follow up with calls home. But the deeper they dug themselves, the more they expected someone to be angry with them. The more they expected the teacher to say, no, you can't uh, do anything for me anymore because the deadline's passed. And I'm gonna see if I can find this quickly for you because I adjusted my grading and I likened it to working out. So I told them that I couldn't sleep one night because I was up thinking about this. And then I introduced them to my trainer and I went to Utah last January to work out with this guy. And you don't argue with Bobby. <laughs> well, Bobby's the kind of guy where if he tells you what to do, you go, okay, Bobby. And he used to be a, I think it was a kindergarten or a third grade teacher. And then he was a police officer and now he has his own gym. But here's why I brought up Bobby. First of all, every one of my students went, what? But I said, you know, if Bobby tells me to do a hundred bench presses and I don't finish them by Thursday, am I gonna go to Bobby the week following and say, hey Bobby, are the bench presses still valuable if I do them now? What do you think Bobby's gonna tell me? Of course they're still valuable. And again, to go back to where I started, seems like a long time ago already, but in the beginning when I talked about time and I talked about the assumptions we make and let us breathe de l'escalier, why would I prevent a student from doing work when the student wants to make up work and get it better? That's what we're here for. Now, I'm a big fan of accountability. I'm a big fan of excellence. When it comes to the adults in my life, I confess I have less patience than I do for adolescents and students. 
because, you know, come on. But at the same time, if I'm trying to help people start that conversation with themselves, I don't know whether or not they've had adults in their lives who have supported them or who have been arbitrary in their temper or punished them. One of my best readers in any language was a girl named Leslie. And I said, Leslie, you read so fantastically well and you understand things. You constantly make contributions to the class that helps us. How did you get to this point? When did you start to love reading? And she looked at me and she said, I don't love reading. I've never loved reading. Now, I was wrong and I was totally shocked. So I asked her, how did this happen? Because my own orientation to reading when I was little, and you see the books, it was my escape, it was my entertainment. Sometimes it was my connection at bedtime with my mom or my dad. But that wasn't the way it was for her. And she's in the majority when it comes to my students. For Leslie, it was a chore. It was a job. It came with school. She never had a choice about what to read. It was never something fun. The threat was if she didn't do it or didn't do it well, she'd be working in the fields alongside her parents or working in the, the cannery. And so for her, reading was a threat. It was an obstacle to be overcome. Now, to come a long way back around to the question, and <laughs> my students will tell you when sometimes they ask me a simple question, they'll get a long answer. But that's not because I intend to ramble or that I get lost in my thoughts. It's because I take every choice we make very seriously. And it's important to me that my students also understand that I don't do this lightly. If I make it so they can turn in work late, if I argue with another teacher who says, oh no, that's just giving them a chance to procrastinate, I do it for a reason. And Nieves was very kind in her introduction. But just today, I did a show and tell with students. Um, because we do have some teachers who, and I'll come back to that coronavirus post in a second. But I said, all right, I'm gonna do a show and tell today. And I showed them that I have a book coming out. And they didn't realize it at first. I didn't say it that way. I said, hey, do you notice anything about this book? And then one of my students said, hey, your name's on it. I said, why? yeah, why do you think that is? But it took an extra beat for them to realize that their teacher wrote a book. That was a big deal. And the reason it was a big deal wasn't because I was showing off. I was proud of what I had done, yes. But the reason it was a big deal is because most teachers don't do the work they ask their students to do. And I had to tell my students, you know, I'm not writing about basketball or, or you know, weaving here. This is on point with the work that we're doing. And I think sometimes you're right about the nutrition that the students do or don't get outside the classroom. So I try and bring as much of what I can to show them what's possible, not because I expect them to do it. In fact, it's just the opposite. I expect them to know that I'm not going to ask them to do anything that I wouldn't do myself. So as an example, my students are reading Fahrenheit 451 in one class. And I put up audio recordings for them. Let's see Fahrenheit this 451. And I can't stand to listen to myself talk much. I will later in the, in the time that we spend together because I do want to show you some examples. Um, but I also, let's see if I can find the post on Medium. My students um, came to me one year, just a few years ago, and basically said, hey, Dr. Preston, um, you know, you want us to write an essay, why don't why don't you write an essay? And so I said, okay. And I published it on Medium so they could see it. Uh, oh, these are my published ones over here. And then we read together. And I put myself on the line. I related exactly what happened in the introduction to the essay. Sometimes I will even deconstruct an essay and write online with my students. And I know some of you do the same thing. I think that's very valuable because, you know, when we think about an essay, essays in school are horrible. 
the five paragraph essay, you know, and I'll get to grading later, but five paragraph essays are not essays. Those are gradable samples of data that a, a teacher can easily look through and say, is there a thesis statement? Are there reasons, details, or facts? Is there a beginning, middle, and end with transitions? Okay, well, that, that's fine as far as grading goes and efficiency, but when it comes to the original essay, that was Michelle de Montaigne, and I teach my students about this because my students, when I ask them about the experience of writing an essay, will use words like shaking, fear, depression, giving up. It's daunting, and it doesn't have to be that way. What I help try to convey is that essay means to try. Montaigne was just trying to make himself understood. And I can't think of anything more important in this world than to be understood, than to be seen, and to feel in connection with other people. So when I invite students to write, and it is an invitation, you know, assignment, again, comes back to power. And I do take the language I use very seriously. When I invite students to write, and I make requests around what I want to see on their blog, they come away with the sense that they have an opportunity to make themselves more understood. Now, I don't normally do this in a given year because I feel like everything's on the blog, you should see it, but this year things have been really difficult. So I've asked students to consult the work product page that I created. And so week by week, they can see everything that they've been meaning to do. And if they need to, they can go back and catch up on their work. As a process note, while I'm thinking about it, I do the same thing with Zoom meetings. Um, they have all of the information they need to join our Zoom meetings, and so will you if anybody wants to join us. And I also post recordings. So you can see the entire fall semester from this year in Zoom at least once a week. So that way, if somebody misses it, because all of my students have competing demands on their time and their emotions when they're not in school. So it's not only caring for younger siblings, it's making money for the family, it's all the, the whole menu. And I'm sure that some of you have the same in your communities. So the asynchronous part of this becomes important. Now a student can take my class completely asynchronously. You can see they've got everything they need on the blog. All of the texts that I require reading together, they can see on the blog. I am not at all concerned about copyright because we provide the text in school for free. In this class, I think they're all old enough that they're not covered anyway. Also, as a process note, while I'm thinking about copyright, if you notice, here is a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial 4.0 international license, which basically means that anyone can take anything they want to from this blog. They can redistribute it. They can remix it and adapt it. The only thing they can't do is make money on the stuff that I've created. And my reason for that is simple. You can't steal what's being given away. So now you're all my friends. If you find anything that I've ever posted on a course blog, please feel free, it's yours. And I would respectfully request that you not try to turn around and make a buck because we're all kind of living in that world. And one of the things that I do with students is we talk about the remix. Um, it may or may not surprise you to know that just about every work of genius was not an individual effort. It's a collaborative effort. So the things that we do and the things that we make, we contribute. Those of you who have read about the commons will be familiar with this language. We share things and in turn, we make each other better. Um, some of you might be familiar with the Medici effect, wonderful business book, but also a phenomenon that I see happen all the time. When we combine disciplines, magical things happen. So by combining people, combining media, and combining disciplines of academic thought, we enrich our students' experience and we give them an opportunity to explore what's truly meaningful. Now here's how I do that. When my students come into my course, I ask them, to come up with a question. And we might do the same in a moment. Um, you might think as I'm describing this, 
of something that you're genuinely interested in learning. And in a few moments after I walk us through this, uh, I'm going to invite you to contribute your question in a list in the chats. And then we'll play for a few minutes in the same way that we might if we were joining a course together. So what I tell students is that, you know, actually I should back up a step. You know how we talked about the onboarding a little bit earlier? Um, I also ask my students on the very first day, whether we're in person or online, whether or not this works for them. When you think about it, if I come into a classroom and I tell students, great, here's how this is going to go, they've seen that act before. And at that point, I am another middle-aged white male standing up in a position of power and not giving people a choice, even if it's a better solution. So when I introduce open source learning on the first day of school, I share some examples of things that students have done in the past. So for example, I might talk about um, in the current courses, I have this wonderful picture on the homepage of the course blog. Now I took that picture out of the backseat of an airplane that was being flown by one of my students. This is the central coast of California. Um, and what happened was about the picture on this blog. I put up a blog post when this took place and it's worth the digression. I want to help you understand how this works before I tell you what makes it work. So Matt Reynolds was a student in my class and I'm going to scroll down to the bottom here. And on his course blog, which for some reason it looks like the link may not be working. Let's see. Oh, there we go. On Matt's course blog, which is still in existence, even though this was 2014, another nice feature of open source learning, depending on the platform you use, is it's there. And not only can the students trade on the value of what they create with college admissions officers, potential employers, scholarship judges, etc. But we can also learn over time. So Matt wrote, I think life during high school and life after high school is just the same thing, blah, blah, blah. And then he wrote, for me, high school is a waste of time. So instead of taking offense, you know, he wrote, uh, students want to be more specialized and not generalized. He felt like if you give me something that I like and can use in the real world, then I'll knock your socks off. I'll knock your freaking socks off, he wrote. So I wrote, all right, great, fair points. So do that. What's it going to look like? So Matt told me that he wanted to become a pilot and that nothing in high school was preparing him for that. He was right. Nothing in the comp comprehensive American high school curriculum is going to prepare you to be a pilot. So I said, we probably need to find you a mentor. And we found this guy named Ed. Ed turned out to be magic. Ed was a pilot at a local airport who had had this plane through two generations of his family. And he taught Matt to fly. And then Matt invited me up and scared the crap out of me and said, do you want to take a flight? And I thought, okay. This video and these pictures and this account would not have been technologically possible just a few years ago. In 1980, when multiple choice reigned supreme when I was in elementary school, one gig of memory that no one would pay a single dime for today. In 1980, one gig of memory cost $300,000. The fact of the matter is that school has not kept up with the technology, the culture, the economy, or even the climate. So the kinds of disruption that we're seeing now with the campus closures because of the pandemic are really not pandemic related. The kinds of disruptions we're really seeing are that schools are not prepared for disruption of any kind. They're not resilient, they're not flexible, but the beauty is that people are. We have that capacity. So as individual teachers, for me to look at Matt and say, well, all right, what do you want to do? How do you want that to roll? 
that becomes impressive. So I'll get to the big question in a moment, but for now, asking students what they want to do and showing them examples of what's come before. I show them this video. Let's take a minute and watch this and I'll get caught up with the chats here. The vast majority of behavior problems in the classroom involve minor breaches of discipline. These incidents frequently originate in the classroom situation itself and are within the control of the teacher. Disciplinary problems in the classroom are symptoms of underlying weaknesses in total learning situations. So this kid that was at the board was a white hat hacker. Now this was back in, gosh, I don't know how many years ago this was now, I think 2010 or 11. And back then, Anonymous was notorious online and in a heroic way because yes, they were disruptive, but they were disruptive with values. And this guy came to me privately and said, you know, I've been doing some white hat hacking and instantly, I realized that we had an expert on internet security. Who better to teach the class? In the same way, the pilot, who better to teach that young man to fly? The mechanic down the block, who better to assess whether or not someone knows what they're doing around a transmission or a carburetor? So it's not uncommon for me to invite students to share their knowledge because when you teach something, as the saying goes, you have to know it twice as well and you have to be able to articulately present it. So this goes on for a few more minutes, but what I want to draw your attention to is that, despite from a very young shaven version of me in there, this is all students. And this video was made by students. So on the first day, I'll share this, but I'm not there to sell the students on the idea. I'm there to give a definition of open source learning, which is essentially using the internet to amplify and accelerate your ideas with the benefit of the surrounding community and experts in your field, whatever that looks like. And most importantly, it's their call. If students were to come to me and say, no, I don't wanna do that. I'm much more comfortable with the textbook because I know how to play that game and enough people said that, I would say, okay. When I ask them to decide this, when we're on the physical campus, I actually leave the room because just my being there can influence how the conversation goes. And I don't want that to happen. It's a way of showing them trust. Most educators will tell you that's not okay to leave the room. My God, what are you doing? Well, I've never waited for more than two or three minutes. And I tell them, we ha I teach them how to make a consensus-based decision, which is a very difficult process. To get everyone to agree on anything, even on pizza toppings, is a challenge. But every time I do this, and, and admittedly, sometimes it's just because students don't want to do things the way they've had to do them for so long. Students will come out, and a moment later, I've already told them, 
Like Benjamin Franklin said, we all hang together or we all hang separately. What's it gonna be? And they opt to do something different. Better yet, I asked them to comment to this post on the course blog because I need to not feel alone. By the way, I also get to see them writing on day one of a new class. So all of these young people, and this is this year, this is without meeting me in person, make a contribution and sometimes they'll back off of it. They'll change their mind. You can see that some people deleted their comment or removed it by the author and then thought of something better to say. That's all valuable information. And uh, Vicente, thank you for your question. The question here is, I mentioned that Canvas was a cause for concern and what platforms would have my approval. So it's, it's challenging because the internet has gone from this wonderfully democratic open technology to now big content, big government, almost all of us are operating in someone's corporate lobby. Even what I'm showing you right now, Blogger owned by Google, owned by Alphabet, the benefit to Blogger and Alphabet of data, even the data that I create with my students, you know, we don't get this for free without a reason. I'm working with a team right now, um, and yes, thank you for pointing that out, Angela. Canvas is an LMS, uh, and that's what I'm talking about. But the partnership that I'm working with now is a group of people who are interested in the Fediverse, in open source software. Uh, I was fortunate to meet folks like Tim Riley and uh, Brian Bellendorf, Linus Torvalds. So the same people that essentially developed open source software movement are taking an interest in how do we help young people understand the internet more effectively and use the semantic web and use the kinds of open source software that we have to develop their own suites, their own instances, their own platforms. So right now I'm working with a programmer in Ireland, a programmer in India and a few others who are actively developing platforms that do blogging, microblogging like Twitter or Mastodon, video conferencing like Zoom, but have it on open source so that you can take the code and develop for your own community. And if you need the support, you know, some people are comfortable with Linux, other people need a red hat to help them instantiate this stuff. Um, the short answer to your question is, if you can use my model, I use Blogger, I also use WordPress. I'm gravitating more toward WordPress now than ever before because WordPress, I can spin up an instance in the cloud. I can give students a discrete identification so that they have that. I didn't mention this earlier, but that's another challenge around any LMS or school-based, institution-based program. If, um, you know, for developing websites to answer Luz's question, we can work. Um, but what I was going to say about email and access is that when you have an institution granted license, but then you graduate or you leave, you lose everything. So another challenge that I have with students is to help them understand, this is you, this is yours. This is your footprint. I guarantee you, and some of you probably already know this, but your data has been curated and collected and profiled and used for 50, 60 years. It started with credit reporting agencies and credit cards, and it's gone from there. And now it's refined to the point, you know, if you haven't seen the documentary Social Dilemma, you owe it to yourself to spend an hour and change and think about the implications of the use of your data and the use of our students' data. Um, it could be as simple as calling an 800 number and getting the red carpet treatment or getting rerouted to God knows where and sitting on the phone for an hour and a half. Um, or it could be more sinister. Uh, a conversation that you have in your home suddenly leads to an algorithmic decision to put an ad in the feed of someone who wasn't even doing that search, but whose phone was listening to the conversation. That sounds like science fiction, except it's not, it's real. All of the smart devices that you own, your TV, depending on the generation, your refrigerator, 
there, there have been hospital dishwashers that have been hacked and the stories go on and on. I will put some of these in the curated feed. And I see KP's comment, yes, Big Brother is watching, but the thing of it is, we get to decide what Big Brother sees. We still have a lot of agency, but this is where awareness building becomes so important. Now, what I've said to school districts and what I've said to IT people in schools and teachers as well, is that we have an opportunity to turn into the skid you know, if you've ever driven a car and found yourself hydroplaning or, or in, a, in an uncontrolled skid, the temptation is to control and go against it. And it only makes things worse. Uh, if any of you are skiers, you see the same thing when someone feels like they're going a little bit faster than what's comfortable. And so they lean back. Well, the problem is when you lean back, you let your skis go and you actually go faster. So for us right now, a lot of people are rightly concerned about the role of technology in our learners' lives. But the thing of it is, a lot of these same people have been resisting technology for years. And the only result has been that more and more students become habituated users of a product that then engulfs their lives without understanding it at all. So from my perspective, what we should be doing is turning into the skid we should be using more of what we know about technology and not less. That doesn't mean we're going to agree on everything. Um, you know, Vicente, you raise a good point about hosting. Right now, I've decided to pay for some things out of my own pocket. It's not that much more than what I would be paying for, you know, my uh, professional memberships, you know, for professional teaching associations. So I made a switch. I decided that I was going to host things on my own. There are some really good low cost services. Now, I don't recommend that a teacher pay anything out of their own pocket. God knows teachers should be paying, uh, teachers should be getting paid a lot. If you've ever read studies about the impact of an influential kindergarten teacher on the life of one student and the economy, the average kindergarten teacher should be making about between a quarter and a third of a million dollars a year. Now, Let's draw things back from the technology and come back to how we introduce this to students. So let's assume that a course or a teacher introduces this and it's adopted. Well, what happens next is there's an invitation. And, and this is where I wanna come back to Matt and the big question. Uh, all of us are sense-making machines. We like to connect the dots. In fact, when there are less dots to connect, we go into overdrive. The less information we have about someone, the more we make up a story. If you look at Yelp, most of the reviews are really, really positive or really, really negative. There's not a lot of nuance. But all that sense-making machinery tends to go hungry at school. That, it's not getting a lot of, of grease in the gears, and that's why they tend to grind, and sometimes they overheat, and sometimes they just lock up and stop. So what I try and do through open source learning is remind people that kids are passionate, they're curious. If you ever really want to energize yourself and we ever get out of this thing, go to a kindergarten classroom and listen to the number of questions a student asks and with what kinds of enthusiasm. It's wild. It is crazy in such a good way. Over time, what happens is, and I tell the story in this blog post, and I'll include the link to this as well. Over time, we stop asking questions. The average four or five year old asks over 100 questions a day. And by middle school, nobody even wants to raise a hand. So first, I see this as like almost a rehabilitation project. We are raising intellectual veal in our school systems. And we need to like return them out to the, to the free range and get them moving again. When I ask students, what do you want to know? You know, this link this year, the students were bananas. They were asking all sorts of crazy good questions that naturally engaged that interdisciplinarity that I was talking about earlier, that Medici effect. But some students aren't ready for this. They're not trusting of the process or even of me. And so a lot of the time they'll be, kind of cagey about it. I even had one student, you know, you can imagine the smart aleck, 
who says, okay, well, can I go to the bathroom? Whoa, what a great question. First, you've got grammar, can versus may, right? I'm a smart aleck too. But let's talk about this for a minute. Bathroom, you've got power politics, indoor plumbing, the haves and have nots of economy and racism and colonialism. You've got school culture. You've got, I mean, there's a world of things, fluid mechanics. So literally any question is an interdisciplinary question. And this is the time that I actually want to stop the screen share so I can see the chat window larger. If you're willing, take a moment and ask a question in response to this prompt. If Forget school for a second. If there weren't classes and curriculum and graduation requirements in college, what would you study? What do you really want to learn more about? Put a question or two in the chat and let's play. Building a computer. Well, that's a softball, man. There's so many great topics in that. You can imagine if you think about the average high school curriculum, you've got room for all of that and you can map it to age and stage appropriate standards and go from there. Systems, yes. Anthropology, yes. The dreams of my students, I love this. You guys are ringers. Tourism. Yes, brilliant. And here, I thought this was going to be hard. Somebody send me one that you think you can't possibly make this in interdisciplinary study for a semester. Language is great. Life in Mars. The brain. Looking out the window. Okay, so that one I'm going to play with. Looking out the window assumes that a person is wanting to imagine a space somewhere other than where they are or that they're daydreaming. When you think about this, there are so many beautiful images in literature, in music, um, in painting, in sculpture, just for starters, to represent the window. Second of all, a window is a metaphor. And when you think about it, the most popular operating system in computing, to link back to the person with the, uh, the computers, and I'll involve the train in a second, Senora Trujillo. Uh, we use words that aren't what they mean. We use words as symbols. And one of the wonderful things about humanity, you know, Homo sapiens was one of about seven or eight, at least, hominid species around the time of... Uh, I think it was 70,000 years ago, the cognitive revolution. And Homo sapiens won. But there were Neanderthals and Denisovans and Homo erectus and Australopithecus. We weren't alone. The thing that enabled us to win, and there's a wonderful book called Homo sapiens by uh, Harari. And in that book, he talks about the fact that our ability to share abstractions enabled us to collaborate in larger numbers than the Dunbar number, 150, right? The Dunbar number is that natural inclination we have to know who's supposed to be in the group and who's not. But beyond that, how do we organize? Well, let's talk about our metaphors. Anyone can, I mean, people think, well, what makes people different? Is it language? No. Almost every animal has language. Go out and listen to the birds in the trees. It's what we talk about that makes us different. And in fact, it transcends language. If someone is a member of the Catholic Church, they can go to any country, and no matter if they're speaking Czech or Japanese or English or Spanish, they'll have a sense of the rituals and the symbology, and they'll know who's in and who's out. Same thing if someone's a Green Bay Packers fan. So when we talk about windows, we have this ultimate unifier because we have a concept that we hold in common even if we don't know the language. Um, why do you call it a desktop on your computer? There's no desk. Why do you call it uh, a website? There's no real estate. There's no physical location. It's because we deal in metaphors. So when we start, um, and uh, the name of the author for the uh, Homo sapiens is Harari. Yuval Harari. Um, 
Now, when I ask students to come up with a big question, this leads pretty rapidly to a study. And then we get to remixing the curriculum. Because now, not only are students thinking about the tools that they need, now not only are students thinking about how they can follow what they're genuinely interested in, they're not only thinking about the technology that they can use or the ways that they can represent what they know, but they're also thinking about how they can make it their own. Now, has anybody seen these guys? I'm gonna play this for just a second. Enjoy this with me and then we'll talk about why I'm playing it. What's up YouTube? Back with another video, back with another banger, back with another reaction. <laughs> Get too much to ever back down from a challenge or a world. Closed mouths don't get fair, so I ain't bite my tongue. Gotta get to this grip all the days I ain't have a crumb. Glad I stopped this rapping shit, thought we were stuck in the slump. Just realized I'm not sharing my screen, so let me get back to this for a second and show you what I had in mind here. Because what these guys are doing, first of all, about six months ago, I want to say, they became like the hit of YouTube and everybody wanted to see their videos. And this is what they did. It's just two twins in a bedroom. And they used to review uh, rap albums. And then someone gave them the idea that they should look at music that they were not familiar with, maybe older stuff. And so they wound up listening to Dolly Parton, and in this case, Phil Collins. But get a sense of the dynamic here, and then I'll talk about why. Get to myself, but back down from a challenge or a world. Close mouth. Yeah. What is this about? What is this about? Let's see. Sound like a, a, a rain entrance or something. Okay, hold up. Mm -hmm. Sound like they're gonna go crazy. It look like he's staring at my soul for real. Yeah, I can't look at him. Man. All right, so this kind of response video is an example of what can happen when you take information from one medium and you represent it differently. Teachers for a long time have been doing things like taking vocabulary words or definitions and inviting students to share definitions with graphic representation, with animation, with GIFs. All of those are fine, but what happens when we take the script and we flip it? So that now, as I mentioned earlier, when I created audio recordings for books, what if I record video lectures, but instead of just leaving that as an asynchronous opportunity, instead, what happens if I share it with students in real time and we respond to it together? So for example, if I put up a mini lecture, and by the way, in this environment, none of my lectures, none of my lessons where it's input are more than 10 minutes. We don't need that. There's all sorts of texts and resources, but the interaction with the students, the engagement is the key to keeping them involved with the course, keeping them involved with people, and ultimately helping them succeed in the course. So I'll play something like this with them, and I'll fast forward a little bit just so we can get to some actual stuff. Sure. Guy falls in love with a girl. Girl seems to fall in love with a guy made. Wait a minute, I might say, if we're watching this together, what makes anybody think that Daisy falls in love with Jay Gatsby and the Great Gatsby? And we can talk about that in real time as though we're watching a show where somebody else is giving us the input. Obviously, I'm in charge of creating the input that we discuss so I can guide the agenda, 
but the experience of it is watching it in real time together and having something to respond to that we share. It's kind of like the old days when you would come to school and somebody would say, hey, did you see that show on TV last night? And then people would have a shared experience around that. Now I'm sensitive to something. I know that on the West Coast, it's after five. On the East Coast, it's after eight. And I could do this all night long, knowing that there's a big buffet to choose from and different ideas. And so at the very beginning, I promised you that I wanted to make this valuable. In the last, say, half an hour, hour, what would be the most valuable for you? What would be the thing that you'd like to learn more about, either because I introduced it or because I haven't, that you'd like me to spend some time on, given what you expected coming into this session? And I'm looking at the chats to see. I told myself I was going to let this dwindle to 100 participants and then I was going to ask the question. That's my reason. Ah, thanks, David. Much appreciated. Okay, creating shared experiences. Let's focus on that for a moment. And there's literally a link and a case study and a topic for just about anything you could imagine. But one of my favorites is shared experiences because using the internet gives us a unique opportunity to collaborate. And give me one moment, I wanna find a blog. Oh, while I'm doing this, I was just talking about remixing and I would hate to end this without giving Josh Montero credit. So every once in a while, you'll have a student take things to the extreme. And I created a gaming environment for one of my courses and I didn't announce it, it just happened. And it was called the Sphinx. And students showed up in the unlikeliest places challenging each other to write. So if you can see this, and I'm gonna try and make it as big as I can here. This kid produced a video. This is actually the real deal. He was on a roller coaster and someone challenged him to write an essay. Now this video goes on, I'll share the link with you, but I can tell you that uh, this is at Magic Mountain in Southern California. And there is a moment where he does actually do a 360 and write upside down. I believe that's the first in history, but he did pass the AP exam, so it couldn't have been all bad. Now, the blog that I want to show you involves a collaborative process that I did with a class Is there anybody who's a William Gibson fan by any chance? Let's see, it might be here. It would work better if I could find the right blog. So the idea was that students of mine and I deconstructed an article interviewing William Gibson. Oh, here we go. And in order to do this, I, let's go to view blogs so we can do this even more easily. I introduced students to the concept of a mind map, which at that point was not very common. So this is back in 2012, 2013. And what we did was we set up an environment. We started with ether pads. We looked at mind maps. We decided to um, use a particular tool. And then we gave ourselves 24 hours and we created a mind map. And the result
within 24 hours was a mind map that explicated every single thing in the article. It would have taken any one of us weeks to do this in real time if we were acting alone. I don't want to upgrade. I want to find my old mind map. <laughs> well, you can see I haven't been on this in years, so I'm not really sure if this is going to lead me to, but I will post a link in the notes so that you can see it. And the question that I wanted to answer with that was that all of us can create environments where we can populate a document or a mind map or even a more creative endeavor, a musical composition, an artistic composition in real time. Carmen, thank you very much for that feedback. The reason that I didn't do more interaction today was because all of this is introductory. And my sense was if there was something that someone wanted to go more in depth with, that they could reach out to me or they could follow links when I post the annotated notes. But I wanted to go for the most information along the broadest stuff. So elementary school tips. The idea behind younger students is you gotta have activity. Keeping people in front of Zoom for hours on end is cruel and unusual. And I don't, you know, going back to that journalist who followed the high school students through their day and was so exhausted as a result, remember she wasn't exhausted from physical activity, she was exhausted from inactivity. And I don't like the schooling model we have on campus, but to try and replicate that and make courses be the same sort of environment. I watched my daughter participate in a Zoom class with one of her teachers the other day, and it made me so angry because the class happened to be a music class. And the teacher spent the first five minutes doing what teachers have done badly for decades, for centuries, lecturing the students about the noise that they were making coming into the class. But for God's sake, at this point, if we can't celebrate young people still having the energy and the optimism and whatever it takes to make a joyful noise in a music class. So, you know, when it comes to elementary school, I would try and engage the families as much as possible when possible. And I recognize our mileage may vary, but doing things like scavenger hunts around the house, doing things like asking parents where they were, you know, depending on the age appropriateness during big events in history, like 9-11, or uh, the election of President Obama or anything that's significant, but having conversations and having interactions and moving their bodies, super important. I'm glad you thought that was helpful. Um, you know, I see this from uh, Juan Luis about the eighth grade students. Um, what if it's perfect? And I'm going to go back to that Kintsugi image that I started with earlier, that cracked vase. There has never been a day that I've taught, and this is absolutely true, there has never been a day that I taught in nearly 30 years that I haven't gone home and realized, oh my God, there was something I forgot, or there was something I can do better. That's teaching. In fact, if you don't feel like a constructive failure, at least sometimes, I would say you're a failure then legitimately. Because the constant process, the Kaizen of teaching, the constant process of improvement, that's everything. That's modeling learning. Now, I'm not trying to take away the sense that we all have right now that things are not going well. I empathize. But the challenge is, and Erica, I see your response. It's not just you, it's happening with everyone. That's, that's also not empathetic. That's not gonna make me feel better either. I don't care if somebody else is in pain. I'm still suffering here, so be with me on that. I think though, the opportunity is to be aware of the fact, you know, there's an old story about Thomas Edison. And when one of his laboratory assistants said to him, we've been doing this all day and we've, we've accomplished nothing. We've tried this a hundred different ways and it doesn't work. We're, we're back where we started. And Edison said, nonsense. We have discovered a hundred ways it doesn't work. So what have we discovered since March when campus is closed? We've discovered that well-intended efforts to use out-of-the-box software to try and do the same crap 
we were doing in K-12 and college education before is a bad idea and that we can be doing it differently and that we can be exploring it more effectively. And that starts with some empathy for ourselves and it starts with some respect and some care for the relationships that we build with our students. I think that feeling like a failure, Peter Drucker also had some wisdom that I might share with you on the subject. He said, the worst thing that management can do is the wrong thing more efficiently. And when you look at the triage systems, you know, the vast majority of educators, parents, students, administrators, were not prepared for what happened. They don't understand technology. They don't understand learning very well. They're not well versed in neuroscience. They're not well versed in learning the lives of students as opposed to imparting the lessons. So given all of that, you could actually make the case that the whole lot of good things that are happening are a really pleasant surprise. That might actually be more disruptive than the expectation of the bad things that would happen when campus is closed. Now as for people who say, well, what about the lost year, the lost year of learning, the learning gap? Well, we certainly have a gap between social classes. We certainly have issues regarding sexism, racism, intolerance of all sorts of people for all sorts of bad reasons. But Sarah's point is so well taken when she says, I want to believe this pandemic was one of the few things that could happen to have a small chance to change the education system. That's why I wrote the book. That's why I do what I do the way that I do it. Every interview that I gave 10 years ago, when I started using the public internet, every interviewer asked me if I was afraid of being fired. Nobody wanted their kids near the internet. Oh my God, they have gambling and porn and somebody might sell you a car. So now between the campus closures, because school isn't closed, campus might be, but school isn't closed and people definitely haven't stopped learning. We're learning all the time. We're learning who we can trust. We're learning about our politics. We're learning about racism. We're learning about meritocracy and whether there is a level playing field. We're learning about hmm, this whole thing about social contracts and you're going to have a life as good as your parents if you graduate school. We're learning a lot. The challenge is, and thanks to those of you who talked about the social dilemma earlier, um, Young people today are not certain about what they can trust. You know, if I hold this pen up and I ask about gravity and I say, does any reasonable person think if I do this 10 times that at some point it won't drop? People would say, well, that's not really controversial. And yet when we talk about climate change or evolution or other concepts, suddenly it's all relative. That's tricky because that's not merely a question of critical thinking or trust. It's bigger than that. It's not actually sharing reality. And at that point, we really run into trouble. So I think that some of your comments here are, are spot on. It's not about one person in front of the room, whether that's in a classroom or online, telling other people about reality the way that they're expected to play the game. That's bankrupt. And if it wasn't bust before this last president, it's definitely worth taking a hard look at now. Because, you know, when my own extended family can have people in it who I want to believe are caring, I want to believe are thoughtful, but they tell me things about the coronavirus that, how do you explain that? And then how do you balance the desire to be kind and compassionate with the desire to make sure people understand what they need to survive and not threaten each other's well being. Well, that's where I think the First Amendment has a hidden benefit that a lot of people don't talk about. When we talk about this technology, I get a lot of questions from educators who tell me things like, you know, I'm a little afraid that my students, especially the younger ones, are going to say or do something online that might embarrass me. What could that possibly look like? Every single student that I've ever had that I put on the public internet has done the right thing. How do you explain that? And I'm talking about 15 years of data now. How do I explain that? Well, the students that cry out for help, the students that don't feel trusted, the students that feel angry, 
the students who need something that they're not getting have a way of letting us know. That's the benefit of having a country in which free expression is a value because the people who need the help will identify themselves or at least give you warning so that you can get out of their way. If somebody is a racist, I don't want them speaking as if they weren't. I wanna know who that person is because I either wanna help them or I wanna help mitigate the risk that they pose. I'm just catching up with some of the other comments in the chat here. Thank you for all the kind words. I want to make sure that I'm answering questions and I'm just scrolling up for a minute to make sure I didn't miss anything. Hi, Nevis. Oh, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Would you like me to, uh, to recover some of the questions? Oh, yes. I, I've been getting from the chat. Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, one, one of the questions is how do you, uh, how do your students sub submit assignments, assignments to you? So this is where I set up a, a member blog network. Each of my students, and I'll, I'll go back to one of the blogs to, to illustrate, each one of my students creates their own website. And on that website, they curate according to what we agree on as work for the class, but they can also put up anything that uh, they think is important or that they want to share or that they see as interesting. Um, let me share my screen. And if I go here to member blogs, so this is a current course. You can see this is happening now. And the students email me or share with me a screen that says, okay, here's where you can find my blog. And then they post and manage their own blogs. Now, for some of the things that involve personal data, so for example, if I have students uh, write a resume, then I also teach them about security, and we don't want that on the public internet. So I'll have them either create a Google Doc that we can share privately, or they can email me an attachment, but there's a variety of platforms where I can see that online, and it's still in their control so that they can own it. Okay, um, sometimes if we are too, too flexible, some students take advantage and cross the line. How can we handle that? Yeah, so what does that look like? Because that's there, there's a, a legitimate fear that educators will lose control. And it's really interesting to me because I think sometimes that dynamic is fueled by the desire to push against something. And when you push against something long enough and it gives, the first reaction isn't relief or even joy or satisfaction. The first reaction is disequilibrium. If you push, think about it, if you push against something really hard and it gives, ugh, you're out of balance now. Now there has to be a realignment. So for example, in my classes, when we're in campus, I don't require people to ask me permission to go to the bathroom. For goodness sake, that's cruel. If you can't manage your own bowels, how are you gonna get along in life? Now people look at me and they say, well, but what if they're lying to you? I don't know, what if they're lying to me? It's not like I'm not gonna find out about it at some point. And at that point, when I don't get mad and do the expected temper tantrum or threaten them with all the horribles, usually the reaction is guilt and actually what happens more often than not is that other students mitigate this before it even comes to my attention. Because we operate as a community, we operate as a tribe. And when we have norms of respect and trust and then someone blows it or acts out, two things happen. The other community members don't like that because number one, it endangers their continued freedom and they understand that if someone blows this, Things are gonna go back to the other way that they were and they don't want that. But the other thing is that, you know, we have this, uh, the researchers who called the Dalai Lama neuron, the mirror neuron. And when we're in a class and the teacher speaks harshly to someone, even if it's not us, we feel it. And when someone else does something that disrupts the function of a group, and that's why it's important to remember, I call this a member network. 
This is not a classroom full of students who don't want to be there. Giving them the choice in the beginning also engages them from the very first. If you want to do this, you said you wanted to do this, how come it's not happening? I have not had the experience because there's no lack of understanding in my tribe. I have not had the experience that someone runs off and doesn't do the work and feels like they got away with something. If a student doesn't do the work, something else is happening. And that's worth a conversation. That's worth an inquiry. Again, this comes back to something I said very early in the talk. Not everybody sees human nature the way I do. And I can respect the fact that some people assume the worst. But I operate on a very specific set of principles. And that begins with believing that people want to be successful in their lives. That might look like survival. That might look like helping their family. That might look like staying healthy. That might look like a lot of different things, financial success or status. But I'll tell you what it doesn't look like. It doesn't look like getting away with something and looking over your shoulder waiting to get caught. If someone is operating from that place, it's because of a reason. And that reason is worth a conversation to see how we can help each other improve. Okay. Can you have us just, just a second? Because the very, to be fair, the very first question for, um, it was about, uh, David, how you do, because we got that at the very beginning of the talk, and they would like to learn how you do to have your slides at your back, if you could share that, yeah. The way you, you, you've organized your presentation. Someone asked that the very first minute, and I, I, I told that person, we'll, get, we'll go back to this question later, but we haven't. So, yeah. ah, sorry well, to interrupt. Well, first of all, to the person who asked that question, thank you so much for your patience. My gosh, it's been a while. So, this is an app called Mm Hmm, and I just put it in the chat so that you can click on the link. I'll also put it in the annotated notes just in case that person is no longer here or there are other people who are curious. Um, there are several really wonderful um, video presentation editors that people can use um, that are either low cost or no cost. And um, it's fun because when you sit there like a talk show host, uh, you know, it's a, it's a minor league parlor trick in some ways, but just a little bit of production value can really go a long way to uh, energizing your students. And the fun part is when they get the hang of using some of this stuff and the students turn around and do likewise, that's really fun. Ah, thank you, Laura. I appreciate that comment. Okay, uh, one of the questions here is, um, last week there was a 95% disengagement of students on a couple of days in my school. Some of my students tell me they are not made for online learning. Yeah. So, there, I hear several issues in that question. Uh, the first question is, is how does it happen that 85% of the students on a given day decide to be somewhere else? Now, you know, every year I go through this with my seniors in the spring semester, you know, there's a senior ditch day, right? And so I'll find out about it and I'll, I'll be a good sport. But inevitably, it's no longer one day, it's several days. So my first question is, was this a coordinated effort or was it coincidence? If it was a coordinated effort, believe it or not, there's actually something to celebrate here. And I know that sounds bizarre, so let me explain. I don't know if anyone here is a practitioner of Aikido, but Aikido is a martial art that does not emphasize striking out at your opponent. In fact, it involves uh, harmonizing with your opponent's energy so that you prevent harm. And I see the comment in the, um, the chat that it was a coincidence. So let's abandon the possibility for the moment that the students actually coordinated an effort, which would be a separate conversation. If 85% of anyone is not buying into a free comprehensive suite of services and products that is designed to help support them and change their lives for the better, then we need to think practically about this. In the private sector, we would say, we're not making our value proposition. Our constituency does not believe that what we have to offer them is as effective or as important as the other things they could be doing with their time. So their feet are doing the walking. Now, I would want to know more about that. Is that because 
they are not, are they feeling disenfranchised by the school? Are they feeling like they need to meet their immediate obligations in terms of caring for their family or providing through making money? What's going on there? And the comment about we're not made for online learning, you know, students aren't made for school learning either. I heard this early in my career about, well, you know, we can't ask students to do things on computers because not every student has computers at home. Well, not every student has books at home either. Not every student has the knowledge or the skills. In fact, the whole point of going to school is to get something that you didn't have when you arrived. So if they're not made for this online learning, then I would really want to know that person better. I would really want to ask more questions. And I would probably be very gentle in my approach just to simply say, sounds like we found a way that isn't working for you or your family. And I'm deeply concerned because I don't want to sell you on what I have. I want to find out what you need. Are you willing to give me a few minutes to help me understand what that looks like? Okay. Um, another question, what would be the percentage of kids that would show an interest in making appointments with you at high school level? Well, to be honest, and this is the question I answered earlier, I don't know if it was, oh. the, it, it's okay though, I, it, it bears repeating, I think it's worth coming back to. Um, I don't know that most of my students had this deep intrinsic desire or excitement about getting online with me right away. But what I will say is that the invitation was unusual enough that it brought the ones who were on the fence over into my field because they were curious. The other ones that weren't as successful initially in taking me up on the invitation, I invited them twice. And this time I said, you know what, listen, humor me. There was one student, my favorite student, who sent a message to all of his teachers filled with expletives saying, I'm not effing doing this. I'm not doing, and it wasn't the invitation. It was just class in general. Screw school, I just want you all to know, I hate school, I never liked it anyway, and I'm not coming. And I responded to his email. Thanks for writing. That took a lot of guts. You obviously feel strongly about this. And again, as I was just describing, this was a student, if you have that level of energy, you know, I'm not worried about the teacher who's mad all the time. They still have enough energy for that. They got enough energy to do something good. I'm worried about the burnout. And so I see in Mercedes chat that the students are suffering physically and mentally. Yes. And let's be honest, I am too. All of us are. Even if we have a good attitude, even if we have the luxury of a loving family or a backyard with a swimming pool or things that other people want, everyone right now is aware of how badly things are going for so many people. It takes a toll. So. You know, back to the, to the comment about feeling like a failure for not having eighth graders engaged. As a society, we are failing right now. There's no shame in admitting that fact. We had a lot of people get sick because of a virus we didn't predict, we didn't prepare for, and we didn't meet with the kind of coordinated response. You know, the state governments and the federal governments are not providing any sort of clear leadership for schools. We are all making this up as we go along. That's one of the reasons why I structured this talk this way. This was not like, you know, I started with slides, but for everyone who's still with us, you could see pretty quickly that I started asking a lot of questions and throwing a buffet out there to see what was of interest. Because to pretend like any one of us has all the answers, nah, we don't. And it's okay to admit that. The students that we do get and the students who we are helping that we can grow. The students who we're not helping, that we can learn from. And my hope is that we never go back to normal. I don't wanna see school go back to what it was like three years ago. I mean, for crying out loud, have we forgotten that just a year ago, we were doing live shooter drills because students weren't having their needs met and every once in a while, someone would show up with an AR-15. So for me, it's not about how we just recover the way things were. It's how we learn from things in real time right now to discover what we can do for the next generation. Uh, the Economist magazine came out with a study a few years ago that said basically any student who's in elementary school right now is preparing for jobs and economies 
that don't yet exist. So I'm not looking to figure out how to get a kid to memorize the quadratic equation again in the classroom. I'm looking to figure out how we can work together in a meaningful way to create community, to create a sense of healthy self, to create the kinds of practices in life that will enable people to be resilient and deal with disruption. Because whether it's disease or social justice unrest or climate change, we're only headed for more disruption. This is not gonna get easier in some ways. And we need to prepare our young people for that. For that matter, we should prepare ourselves as well. Ooh, Veronica, mm -hmm. you made a great point. I inspired myself and student with some music. I didn't point this out, but you, you hit me right in the, in the, the, like, I love that nerve. So bear with me for one second, because I want to bring one of my course blogs back up to the screen. Every single day, when my students write in their journal, whether we're in class or whether we're online, I play music. And sometimes that is related to what we're talking about. Sometimes it's just a wild hair. You know, yesterday it was about heroes. And so I picked two songs for that. Um, but a lot of times, you know, when before streaming, I would ask my, I would give my students blank CDs at the beginning of the year and ask them to fill it up. And sometimes I'll have my students share their audio or open their mic if it's not too crazy at their house and play their music. It's a wonderful way to remind each other that before earbuds, music was a unifier. And whether it was drum circles or live concerts, you know, we don't have that right now. So I love that you brought that up. Thank you. Okay. Um, I have, I have no more questions to put to you. I mean, not from the, not from the attendance. So um, I don't know, maybe there's something else you want to add if there are more questions coming in the chat. Well, I'm wondering how we're doing on the endurance side of things because I, you know, my students will tell you, my family will tell you, it doesn't take me much. I'll keep going until midnight, but I do want to make sure that, you know, we still have some room in our cups and that there are things that people are really wanting to learn more about. Are there any other practices, you know, as I speak to the, to the participants out there, um, actually, you know what, this reminds me when I gave a talk at, uh, at Ted, one of the things that I told the audience, it really just, I don't know why this didn't hit me before, but when you look out over an audience and you're in a room where you can't see people easily, it's very tempting to wonder what they're all thinking. And so the first thing I said when I gave this talk, you'll see I'm not making this up, this was 2013, I think. What a wonderful moment. We're talking about social far, but also what a time to be alive and thinking about learning. Traditionally, learning was the scene as what happened between our own two ears. And I'm not so sure that's where learning ends. We're talking about social learning now. We're talking about technology mediated learning. I find myself wondering what's going through all those heads right now. That was the moment I wanted to share with you. Because <laughs> I'm still that guy and I'm still wondering what's going through all those heads right now out there. Is there anybody who would like me to focus on anything specific? And for that matter, is there anybody who, and you have my email, you have my Twitter, and I'll put it back up if you need it. But if you'd like to collaborate in any way, uh, I'm interested in that as well, because you know the, one of the fundamentals of learning for me is play. And I mentioned gamifying my classroom, doing these kinds of things. You know, if you read the media enough, you come to believe that everything's a crisis, everything's bad, and everything's wrong. And at its core, learning is fun. Learning creates new neuronal connections that do everything from stave off Alzheimer's to actively fight off depression. Learning makes us happy. I get playful just thinking about it. And, you know, to the wrong person, they might say, God, what is with that Preston? Is he on? What kind of drugs does that guy take? Well, learning basically. So is there anybody who's got questions or wants me to focus on anything else before we part company for the evening? I right, see a new message. Let's see. Great. Thanks for the resource.
Um, I will also put up a link to the Sphinx game that I created and a chapter that I wrote about that that's online. And with that, if nobody's got anything else, um, I'm a little reluctant to launch into an entirely new lecture here because I could easily do that, but I'm worried that I might cause a Spanish rebellion and that your program might have some defectors. Well, and from the panelists, is there anything else that Manuel or Nieves that you'd like to see keyed on? No, I, I just I just wanted to thank you for just uh, this beautiful and very interesting presentation. Um, I see people has been fascinating, fascinated. All commentaries has have been very, uh, very on that on that line. So um, just uh, saying that we are very grateful to you for for doing this for for the uh, span the. The education office of Spain, and I want to remind our the the assistant the the attendants that um, they can they can get the link for this presentation and it will be available for more or less for a week from the day it's it's on, and I would like to point out too that we have a teacher of the year award open now. And they can send applications until uh, 22nd March, 2021. And so, um, yeah, we, we want them to be the best teachers and we want them to demonstrate it and to um, apply to this, to this award. Well, so thank I you. Heard, thank I heard you. An apology. Can I break in one moment? I, I, can't, yeah. I can't believe I neglected to mention the most basic element that I wanted to share with your community because one of the things, when you said translate, it just kicked me. One of the things that we can do online that we can't do as easily in the classroom is translate. So on every one of my course blogs, I have a simple button. If I can find it here. You can see where it says translate. And I can pick for our purposes, I'll pick Spanish. And immediately the entire blog goes into Spanish. So the only language that in my community we, we haven't found a good resource for is Mixteco, but I just wanted to let people know that there are lots of tools that people can use to make this easier for their communities as well. And I would have kicked myself, see, I told you, I was gonna think about something as soon as we hung up, but I would have kicked myself if I didn't mention that. So thanks for letting me break in. It's been a real honor being with you today. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you to you all for being here and for being with us. We expect to, to see you very soon again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. Oh, it was my pleasure. It was really an honor. And you know, if, um, if there are participants still listening and if, if the panelists want to stay on, I will hang out until the last person says good night because I know sometimes the uh, the questions and the, the, the waiting afterwards is some of the richest stuff we have. So uh, I'll, I won't be so quick to, to ring off. One of my pro tips for teachers is that, you know, sometimes my students, uh, the lurkers are the ones that hang out the longest. And just when I think <laughs> they've walked away from their computer and the, the, it's just on, they'll have the question that they've been waiting to ask the whole time. Or the one they asked in the first place and it took, yeah, it was my fault, that one. But yeah. Oh, thank you so <laughs> yeah, much. I know. Because I hadn't seen that and I'm so glad that they got that answered. Yeah, yeah, I think it was, yeah, it was really interesting. But anyway, thank you. It was, wow, I really loved your, your presentation. It was really inspiring. Uh, I really appreciate that. I'm glad that it yeah. made it too. I was gonna ask. Oops. Okay, so yeah. thank you so much. I think, and, yeah. Uh, hope to see you soon. All right, take care. Thank and you. you. Thank you very much. We'll yeah, keep thank, you. thank you. Thank yeah. you. Bye bye. Okay. Bye. Yeah, I think people. Okay. <laughs>